Okay, so if you can't hear me um, speak up because I may wander away too, it's sort of my habit. And I'm old, so I don't uh, change my habits very easily. Um, and I like potato chips, and I'm not changing that habit, I'm pretty convinced. Um, I, I'm going to uh, tell you a bit of a story that starts with some research I did way back when, when I was at the University of Guelph. I think even before we used the terms behavioral economics very uh, commonly, um, just to get the setting right. And I, I will say that I've been working on a lot of different aspects of behavioral economics with food, and I just decided to string some stories together about nutritional information for this context, but I have others. Um, that I could talk about if you're um, interested. Okay, um, disclosures, which I never know exactly what I'm supposed to put, but uh, originally I did do some research that was funded by the Dairy Farmers of Canada, and one of my uh, students whose research I'm going to present was funded by a scholarship from the Dairy Farmers of Canada. Um, we also had this great thing called the Food and Health Innovation Initiative at the University of Alberta that funded a couple of our studies. And I won't tell you where that money came from. It had something to do with a class action suit about pharmaceuticals in the vet industry. But anyway, it was all about vitamins, so we could apply. And IDRC Canada has funded some of the work I'll talk about that we did in India. But I'm mostly grateful to the uh, people who uh, did their master's theses, in all of which in this case, and whose work I'm lifting for um, this presentation. Um, so we've, we've already had excellent definitions of nudges, and I don't really need to say this. I just want to say a couple um, things that I think are important. Um, the um, Sunstein and Thaler definitions of nudges are about not make, removing any options from the choice set that people can actually make, which is pretty critical and also not changing anybody's economic incentives around the choices that they make. And I think those are both uh, pretty key elements. Um, the definition that I looked up um, uh, when I was at my mother's last week, it said also to count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Um, so that means not that it's easy and cheap to implement, but that if I want to avoid the nudge, it's not, going to, it's not going to take a lot of uh, processing time on my part. It's not going to take, I'm not going to have to pay extra to avoid it, all of those sorts of things. And nudges are in general not mandates. They're not telling people what they should be doing or, um, or what the government wants us to do. It's about um, changing the choice set in some way or other. The things down the right-hand side of this um, um, chart are wh how nudge, nudges came into being. And mostly I'm going to talk about the stuff that is under structuring complex choices and mostly I'm going to talk about information sets. Just remember that the things that um, give feedback, like, uh, excuse me, you haven't got your seatbelt on, or those kind of things are also nudges that have been developed and used throughout expecting error. Um, make sure you know that when you design a machine that people have to stick bills into to get something out, that the machine will read the bill regardless of how it is inserted. Not in one um, um, method, because otherwise people will get very frustrated sticking their, um, their bill in 47 different ways before they get it. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about structuring complex choices, and uh, we'll see how we go from there. I'm also going to talk a lot about experiments. And I think experiments is one of the places where we have a gap between um, behavioral economics and the real world. In most cases, um, economists anyway, when they're doing focusing, uh, when they're doing experiments, focus on one aspect of the choice environment and what impact changing that one aspect of the choice environment might have. And realistically, we can't control the environment. The environment's constantly changing, and there would never be a situation where that one aspect changed and nothing else changed for the people making the choices. Um, but the experiments often focus on changes which may be difficult to implement in the real world. They may be costly to implement in the real world, uh, changing packaging or changing the structure of grocery stores overnight is going to be expensive. 
and people want some kind of tangible um, idea that there may be some kind of response to these things, otherwise they'll throw them out. And the one thing about experiments is if they're um, structured properly and um, you manage to get uh, some of the correct information that you want to have, you may get some clues as to the types of people who might be more or less affected by any specific change. Um, it, but it's critical, as has already been said this morning, that they're not predictors of long-term sustained changes because usually they're not in the space where they can even monitor or follow the things to see if even individuals have any kind of sustained behavioral change. So they're not a, a panacea for all things, and but they can give some interesting results. Okay, this was a study that I that kind of def looked at two particular kinds of nudges and I thought it was interesting and I'd throw it up there before I started talking about mine. They're it's a systematic review published in Food Quality and Preference and they're talking about salience and priming as two aspects of nudging and what things are most, expect, um, are most effective from uh, uh, the meta-analysis that they did. But what I wanted to say is the kinds of things I'm talking about are again on the right, um, is that your right or left? Anyway, anyway, on the salient side of that chart, you would think after 40 years I might actually have figured that out. Anyway, um, things like calorie labels, color coding, traffic lights, uh, descriptive labels, um, an invitation from somebody to downsize meals, perhaps at a restaurant, descriptive labeling and taste testing. Those kinds of things are in the salience category and those are pretty well what I'm gonna talk about. Some of the more physical nudges that were mentioned this morning, visibility where you put things in a, in a um, cafeteria line, um, things being available or not being available, visibility, those kind of things are what they would have called priming nudges. So these are only two out of a number of sets, but there were very few studies that um, combined both of these, and I'm gonna stick in the salient side just so you have some idea of what the context is around what I'm gonna talk about. So you have to go back in time, and some of you probably won't even be old enough to go back in time, but I was sitting in my house in Guelph in 1991, and in my Maclean's magazine, which people used to actually read, and it used to be delivered through the mail, um, there was an insert. And it was an insert from an organization called Participation. Uh, which has come and gone in history, but it was well recognized at that time, well known, did major social media campaigns around health and physical activity and all of those sorts of things. And I was intrigued about um, the, this insert, so I'm gonna sh uh, show you a little bit about the contents of this insert. So it talked about fitness and about Canadians and all sorts of things, Canadians striving for better health. Um, of course, it had advertising um, embedded in it. The whole thing was considered to be an advertising supplement on the basis of participation, even though it was, participation would be considered social advertising or marketing. But it, you know, it continued. Um, had articles and ads, interesting. I wonder if they would still advertise the beef people. It's, it was kind of intriguing. They talked a lot about nutrition. You will see a lot of food stories being woven through um, this particular um, insert. And I thought, I'm really curious about that insert. I'm really curious if it has any effect on anything. So um, one of my uh, master's students at the time and I decided that we were gonna do a study. So we got in touch with the participation people and said, can we have the insert? And uh, can we modify the insert? Because we wanna control some different types of information in it and we'd like to see if it actually works and has any effect whatsoever on people's attitudes, on their behavioral intentions and potentially even on their actual um, consumption since you were worried about healthy. Um, eating. And the participation people said yes, as long as you share the results with us, we'll give you the copy and you can print it. This is 1991, remember, so we actually had to take it to commercial printers and they had to print it and staple it together and do all these sorts of things. 
We decided we were going to focus on yogurt. And yogurt, um, I'll tell you more about yogurt lately, later, but yogurt is, was, has always been perceived as a healthier food than many others. Um, it, particularly in the dairy set at that particular point in time. And we were really intrigued about what the role of negative nutritional information being provided in a um, article sense might be vis-a-vis -vis advertising and how these two things interacted, these two sorts of interac information interacted to change people's attitudes and behavior. So then we started thinking about how we were going to do it, and we did a lot of pre-testing in Guelph and um, um, pre-survey work with all kinds of people to find out um, w whether they read things, whether they might read something that came through the mail, whether they, all of that kind of stuff. And our initial results suggested that, yes, enough people probably do read them that maybe we could use this as a test. So we created three different participation um, now I don't know how to go back. Uh, three different uh, part, uh, brochures. Some of our brochures had that ad in it. That was something that we placed in it and we didn't use a generic ad. We used an actual branded um, ad at the moment. And um, some of our uh, brochures, a third of our brochures had this article in it which was written by a nutritionist at Guelph. Um, which was about whether yogurt was really that nutritious if you compared it to ice cream in those days. And uh, some of the um, brochures had both the ad on one page and the article on another page. And we were curious to see if people read these things closely enough for them to have any impact in the short term. So we looked at census tracts in Guelph and picked all the ones with, that would have roughly the same, same sorts of people and then we manually went around and delivered the brochures to people's houses but we didn't front up, we, didn't, we just stuck it in their mailboxes and if you were in an apartment building you were out because we couldn't get it into the mailboxes. But we did houses and we kept everybody as similar as we possibly could and we had to do probably close to 4,000 households in the end to get enough coverage. We, they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know where this insert had come from. If they read McLean's, they might have noticed that there were differences between this insert and the other, but... Um, and three weeks later, we did front up at the door and said, hi, we're here from the University of Guelph and we're doing a survey about food preferences and we wonder if you'd like to fill in the survey and we'd really like to talk to the major grocery shopper in the household. Never mentioned the insert... Um, Nothing. So as far as they knew, there was absolutely no connection between the two of us. So what do you think that we found out of this study? And I'm not going to tell you all the really interesting things people did tell us, but we did have a couple tests to see if they had actually any, any consciousness whatsoever of the, the ad for yogurt that was in the magazine. We also had a little bit of um, further testing to see if they could actually recall anything about the content of the ad. And the same things about the article recognition and the article recall. So I thought I would just tell you a little bit about that. We tried to model um, their responses to some of these questions in terms of what they told us they had consumed of yogurt in the previous couple of weeks. Um, so if they recognized the ad, there was a positive relationship between a higher level consumption and the ad. In, we also modeled their a general overall attitude towards how healthy yogurt is as a food and a multi-attribute attitude that had um, yogurt contains um, important nutrients for your diets all listed out and how important do you think those are for your diet. And that multi-attribute attitude, if they recognized the ad, had a negative relationship between the multi-attribute attitude towards yogurt. Um, so that was peculiar. Um, if they could recall the ad, though, um, there was a positive link between the multi-attribute attitude towards yogurt and um, their ad recall. And there were some significant differences in these three variables, consumption, overall attitude, and multi-attribute attitude across the groups that were made us think there might be a link in some senses. Um, interestingly enough, the negative article recognition had a positive relationship with your overall attitude. So it's like if I saw an article about yogurt, 
it must have been positive. So I, my overall attitude for, to yogurt is higher. But if you actually recalled the content of the article that we placed in the thing, then there was a negative um, and statistically significant relationship. Okay, so these people had no idea that these two things, the brochure we inserted in their house and um, their attitudes, and uh, were linked in any way, shape, or form, and we could still pick up that there was some relationship between what they said they consumed and what their attitude was, and so we were very intrigued about that. Did any of these things last for any length of time? We have absolutely no idea. Did they get reinforced by other things? We did monitor all the stuff that went on in the press around these things, and interestingly enough, in that three-week period, we couldn't find any evidence that yogurt was mentioned in the media but we couldn't control for the advertising of yogurt that they might have seen because there were um, yogurt ads on TV um, and uh, radio, I think, in those days that we um, picked up on. But we were intrigued that there was something going on here but that the effects were opposite to what we expected. There was obviously some social desirability bias in how people responded to some of the statements and we couldn't unpack enough things. Another student came on about three years later and decided that maybe we should extend it a little bit more. And so in this case we picked, and I'm, I'm using these words deliberately, uh, a negative dairy product because in those days we were being told categorically under no circumstances to eat butter, that we had to eat margarine for all sorts of reasons, which which is uh, great if you're in 2017. But anyway, the objective was to identify the role of negative and positive nutritional information on attitudes and behavior and to identify the role of advertising in um, enhancing or offsetting the um, positive or negative nutritional information. So it was all about the combinations and if the combinations had any effect on behavior. And of course, everybody was avoiding butter like the plague and we decided to give up on the household exercise because it had taken us months to figure out the households and to go to the households and to wait three weeks to survey the households and the results were not as strong as we wanted so we decided to even make it a, um, a more experimental environment and we barged up to people in shopping malls and said, here, we've got this uh, participation supplement. Would you like to sit down and read it and we'll give you a coffee and then answer some questions? So it was even more artificial, if you can imagine. We had six groups. We had a control that had none of our stuff in it. We had an ad only, um, a negative article only, an ad and negative article version, a positive article only, and an ad and positive article. And we used the same brochure because we just didn't have the energy to try and find another one and convince another agency that they would actually allow us to manipulate their stuff. But one of the things we were concerned about in this aspect was that in general when we were surveying people or marching up to people in shopping malls that we were uh, disproportionately getting higher income, better educated kinds of respondents and we wanted to make sure we included a broader range of income categories across Guelph. So we did some interesting things where we worked with charitable organizations within the city of Guelph and we asked them if they would, um, the food bank at the time, those kind of organizations, if they would recruit people to participate in our experiment as well and that we would go and, you know, uh, do the experiment with those groups. So we did actually test out different um, income categories of people across the city, which I won't talk about the results, but that was an interesting research approach that we'd um, never tried um, prior to that. This was the ad that the, I think the Dairy Farmers of Canada were running at that particular time and so you understand why we weren't eating butter and they were addressing why we weren't eating butter um, head on in the ad. Um, we worked again with nutritionists in the, at the University of Guelph and came up with a negative article um, which said don't eat butter and how marvelous margarine was for us and, and another article that came up and said, well, it's not that different if you really want to think about it, which we used as the positive um, article. So we didn't lie or make up things or both things were sort of defensible on a science basis. 
So in this context, remember these people are stuck with us for about 20 minutes while they flip through this magazine and they are then forced to do a survey. Nobody noticed the ad, essentially, in the entire um, um, set of people. And again, we did about 3,000 people in this um, Boy, we were at the shopping malls for a long time. Anyway, um, the negative information had a huge impact, changed people's overall attitude towards butter, um, made it even worse. I'm gonna avoid it even more than I did in the past. And by this point, people were starting to put it back into cookies because the dairy industry subsidized the cookie manufacturers to use butter. So they were getting butter whether they wanted to or not. Um, and the multi-attribute attitude was also um, negative and significant if you w saw the um, article with the negative information. Um, positive information had the effect. So this was really interesting. This was very short. We couldn't do anything about consumption. It could only be intention to consume. It was a completely different measure. The three-week one told us that probably the information evaporated. Um, instantaneously, they had some kind of response but um, the ad, um, absolutely nothing, which the Dairy Farmers of Canada was delighted about. So let's um, flash forward a bit. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other research in the middle where we tried to monitor some of these kinds of things. But I had a student at the University of Alberta in 2012 back on dairy products again, so I thought this was intriguing. Um, I don't know if you, um, anybody's aware of it, but our consumption of fluid milk on a per person basis in Canada continues to decline precipitously. We don't have very many actual dietary intake studies in Canada, as you would be all aware of, but the Canadian Community Health Survey in 2004 had done some dietary intake stuff and they were actually a bit worried about some of the nutrient and micronutrient um, impacts of the declining um, dairy product consumption. Um, the darkest line there that is going up is actually continues to be yogurt consumption. It's on a completely different scale though, so I don't want you to think that people are now eating more yogurt than they ever uh, drank milk, because that's not the case. It's just that the trend is so startlingly different. Every dairy product is going down. So. In general, there's a potential, and particularly for lower income people, um, it's been categorized that the food insecure in our urban centers are actually um, missing dairy products um, out of their diet. So we were curious, so what's so good about yogurt and so bad about milk? What, where, where are these things breaking apart? And if you think about it, they're very different categories of um, people's decision making. So we wanted to look at milk and yogurt. Um, in this case, we decided to go interviewing people um, directly. We decided to work with an online survey and we um, worked with a panel from a market research company. We had 1,700 respondents across the country in 2011. And one of the things we used was a stated preference experiment, which I'll show you a little bit more about. And I wanted to bring this up as a as uh, something that people think is sort of an e example of behavioral economics. Other people debate it, but there are some interesting linkages between choice experiments and um, other aspects of behavioral economics. It is an experiment with experimental design. You are controlling the environment that people are seeing. It's a very hypothetical um, sort of thing, so there's all kinds of hypothetical bias associated with the results from these, um, from these studies, as there are with um, many surveys. Um, one thing we had noticed about yogurt at this particular point in time is that yogurt, all yogurt products in Canada were being sold with a significantly expanded nutrition facts panel over what uh, milk was being sold. Milk went for the minimum, the 14 um, nutrients, positive and negative, with the positives on the bottom and the negatives on the top, as is always the case. Um, but yogurt had added all of the um, vitamin Bs, for example, that are present in dairy products to highlight other nutritional benefits associated with um, yogurt consumption. Is there any reason why some of the milks could not be identifying those same things? Absolutely no reason. But did that send a perception to people that yogurt was healthier? Um, we wanted to try adding vitamin fortification, so we did, even though it's illegal to, um, for fluid milks as, a, as an option just to see. 
because um, of course our lower fat milks are mandatorily fortified with vitamin A and D, so they don't want, they, nobody wants any other manipulation with those. There was no reason why milk couldn't be sold with probiotic um, aspects, which was going on a lot with yogurts, but not with milk at that particular point in time. We still had the health check then, and the lower fat milks could, were eligible for the health check. It was all in the definitions, but we had no milks using it for, at the lower fat levels but yogurts were using it like crazy. So completely different set of um, attributes. And of course, there's fat content for these um, products. So we wanted to see if you stuck probiotics on milk or if you added the health check to milk or if you changed the nutrition facts panel, would any of these things change people's perception about milk? Um, as you can imagine, one of the first things we found out out of these 1,700 people, there was about 150 that were dedicated yogurt consumers who told us we would be crazy to think they would ever drink milk. And there were um, milk consumers who never ate yogurt. And the rest of the people were kind of in the middle, which was um, intriguing. Because if you think about it, the products aren't sort of that different in some senses. So this was the way our choice experiment was set up. And there was a, because we had so many attributes, there was a complicated experimental design and people did about eight of these choice sets. And you can see that um, the one on this side has a health check uh, logo on it, which no longer exists in Canada. It was also further vitamin enhanced illegally if Health Canada knew about it. Um, but it has a short nutrition facts panel. Um, the one on the far side has a much longer nutrition facts panel because we've added the vitamin Bs to it. This was on a computer screen so they could zoom in and zoom out to get it much more clearly than you are. It had probiotics in the milk. You can see the fat content varied and the price varied, obviously, um, across these various products. The similar, uh, they also, um, a certain percentage of the group did uh, yogurt, um, and there was the same kinds of uh, changes in the yogurt products. However, we didn't tell the people anything about this. We didn't list out in words what differences they should be looking for. Most stated preference experiments at that time were only done in words. There was no visuals associated with it. So if they saw a difference, they saw it because they actually read the label quite closely. It, otherwise, they were just choosing on price. And we only had about 7 or 8% of the total sample that actually just chose on price. You could, you could unpack that most of the other people were actually looking at attributes from the set of choices that they made. So what did we find out? In economics terms, translating all that regression stuff, it's what attributes gave them some additional value? What premium would they be willing to pay over the normal price for the product to have it come with extra vitamin enhancement, to have it come with a health check, to have it come with a longer nutrition facts panel, to have it had added, added probiotics, or um, obviously they hate fat, so uh, a lower fat content. It'd be interesting to do this one over again today, because I'm curious if how many people have noticed that we're back to whole fat as being the good thing to eat. But you know, people got it. They weren't supposed to have fat, so the lower the fat, the more they preferred it. Uh, but they preferred lower fat more in yogurt than they did in milk. And this was statistically significant across the panel. Why? Like, why do you care more about fat? Anyway, um, I, to our surprise, people didn't like probiotics. Nobody liked probiotics. And when we dug into that faster, they associate probiotics with some kind of technology or some kind of additional thing. We thought everybody must love probiotics in yogurt because you could hardly buy yogurts that don't have probiotics in it at that particular point in time. It turns out the people that think science and technology is great for the world buy a lot of probiotic yogurts and the rest of uh, the normal population is kind of like, don't really understand that. The ad telling me it's good for my um, insides is not really compelling me to um, rush out and buy it. Um, they still would like to see more vitamins, but be sure and put those vitamins in yogurt. Um, don't be wasting your time putting those vitamins in milk. Um, the health check was okay, 
And they noticed and recognized that the longer nutrition panel was giving them some useful information and it had about the same value um, in milk and yogurt. But remember, nobody in milk was using it at that time. So what we were really interested in, and this is the link that's most important, is those people that were willing to pay more for these products, how did it link to some of their other behaviors and their other nutritional attitudes? And interestingly enough, there was some link with their core nutritional knowledge. So that definitely played a role. It was something that we were starting to pick up with the earlier research and some of the stuff we did in between, but it, it came out more clearly when we started doing these studies and we were being more specific about nutrition knowledge. So to want vitamin enhancement, uh, strong positive statistical significance with your level of nutrition knowledge. Um, to not want fat content, strong um, statistical rela relationship with your nutrition knowledge. If you were already somebody that was taking vitamins and supplements, you liked the vitamin enhancement, you liked the health check, and you really hated fat. So clearly there's something going on in this package. But a, a lot of the other results were consistent and I didn't, I'm not gonna show you the same chart for, um, but you notice that it didn't, nothing affected probiotics. So this perception that probiotics were a good thing in the dairy industry is kind of odd with this particular sample of people. Um, what I, what I, what worries me about this is, and I'm not going to show you this, but across time in the work that I've been doing with the Canadian population, the level of nutritional knowledge measured on a variety of different indicators decreases precipitously by years. And old people like me had a certain amount of that at school when we were, we even had to take home ec at school and actually learn something about nutrition. And if the nutrition knowledge is key to any of these behavioral changes to try and encourage healthier eating, and we're not getting it anywhere, it's not going to be a situation where we can shovel it at people with Canada's food guide, or we can shovel it at people through um, um, some kind of social marketing campaign and have any uh, real outcome. We have to take a, a more serious approach to the whole process of nutritional education. So from those studies, on the, uh, a couple of those studies, higher nutritional knowledge but meant you were willing to pay more for um, healthier foods. Uh, people who were already taking vitamins or supplements, who were trying to consume more calcium or who were trying to consume foods where health benefits were definitely willing to pay more for vitamin enhanced products. Um, people who were trying to eat less fat um, didn't like probiotics and they didn't, didn't want to pay extra for lower fat, fat products either. Um, so an awful lot of links between uh, what you know about nutrition, what you know about your own level of nutrition and whether you were interested in any of these products. Just to give you a quick example, the same student that did that master's thesis is actually working now on a specific warning label on breakfast cereals and we're working with children and parents, so we're doing family um, intercept kind of um, surveys to see if they notice any difference between this set of cereal products, where the ones with a very high sugar content actually carry a specific warning label. It's not a traffic light or anything, it's a warning label like you get on clothing or any of those other sorts of things versus this set of cereal products where there are no um, warning labels. And her results so far say the children noticed the warning labels and responded to them more quickly than the parents did. Children, by the way, between eight and 15. And the children had more nutritional knowledge than their parents. And interestingly enough, it's not clear where that came from, um, from the way they answered the questions. So we thought that was intriguing. So we're doing more research on that. Other people have done some similar sorts of nudging studies. I just wanted to present it. Um, this study where they said um, we're consuming lower fat milk in 2015 was a good thing, um, perhaps not in 2017. They said, pick me, I'm low calorie. Uh, and this was in a situation where the people were not paying for the milk. It was a choice they could get free with their lunch in a cafeteria. 
But the pick me, I'm low calorie kind of signal was very transitory and disappeared within a couple of weeks. So in their 12 week study, there was no significant difference um, pre and post the introduction of the pick me, I'm low calorie um, symbol. Um, I, I want to tell you quickly about some work that we were doing on vitamin A consumption. And uh, this started from a big project. I, we were working on a whole bunch of us at the University of Alberta in India. And it turned out that these people who've been home gardening for 200 years needed us to tell them they needed to have a home garden, which is something I don't understand. And secondly, um, that their vitamin A content, although the government of India has been working terribly hard to increase the vitamin A through um, supplementation, from mandatory supplementation um, of all children, the vitamin A was the most limiting um, nutrient in the places we were working in India and incredibly sad outcomes associated with the low vitamin A intake. So we were trying to get at the fact that perhaps people don't like pills and didn't like being given a pill by some stranger who wanders into their village and says, here, have a pill, it'll be really good for you, it's got lots of vitamin A in it. So we wanted to do some kind of experimental work um, behavioral economics, if you like, around would they prefer it to come in a fortified product? Um, the government of India has this year decided to allow, encourage um, a fortification of all cooking oils in India, which will be very good because they're widely variable uh, as to which oils are consumed in which parts of the country. Uh, in Canada, you may or may not know, we have mandatory fortification of margarine, which we've had ever since margarine was introduced in the 1950s, and it's interesting how nobody seems to know that, and of course nobody wants to eat margarine anymore. But you can also get vitamin A out of conventional foods that you could grow yourself. And we have biofortified sweet potatoes, and my anecdotal work in India would say the people there are more concerned about technology and foods that they're eating. There's a huge debate about genetic modification in India that you may or may not know about. So the biofortified sweet potato kind of um, falls into that um, category. So we were interested in looking at their perceptions of naturalness. We also wanted to look at nutrition knowledge and diet and something called food technology neophobia that I won't um, really talk about. But we did find out that if we gave people pills and we gave them some cash and then we said, here, um, we'll take a little bit of that cash back if you would prefer to trade in your pills for carrots or you would prefer to trade in your pills for fortified oils. And um, Harvest Plus wouldn't allow us to sell biofortified sweet potatoes because they hadn't licensed a variety for India so we had to do a hypothetical experiment about the biofortified sweet potato. Um, these results are not in dollars, they're in um, Indian rupees so that they were comparable in magnitude across the two countries. We did it with a panel of sort of normal middle class um, people in Edmonton to see how different it was with these villagers in India and not very is um, intriguingly the result, except that Canadians don't want margarine anymore. Um, fortified or not, but we all want carrots instead of pills, interestingly enough. So these people were actually walking away with a bunch of carrots that would give them the same level of vitamin A content for a week as seven pills, and they were going back to work with these carrots and stuff, which I was intrigued about. Um, we were very um, interested in how um, how strongly um, the preferences were um, expressed in India, which is um, something that is not factored properly into some of the um, intervention designs, I think, when people think about it. But people who associated any level of processing with natural, if they understood that some processing of food was natural, then they liked the fortified oil better. They also liked carrots better in India and the biofortified sweet potato better in India. So there's definitely a link to natural, which shows up in Canada as well. But really what 
came down to the fundamental thing was what their core level of nutritional knowledge was when it began. The little bits of information we gave them um, as part of the experiment in the three hour exercise that they spent with us um, didn't really uh, change some of the people very much. If they came into the room with a well established level of nutritional knowledge, then they responded. And they wanted away from the pills, interestingly enough. So some way or other, they've got a misperception about the pills. So a lot of these different approaches were different ways of trying to link changes in the choice architecture to value associated with particular nutrients for individuals and potential changes in behavior, because of course I can't go back and monitor these people across time. So it's very difficult to predict sustained changes in behavior. I do have another way of doing that. I've worked with the Nielsen Home Scan panel people for a long time, and I go in and do experiments with them, and then I monitor their, their, those same households' behavior across time, and it's quite fascinating, but hugely expensive um, to buy the panel every year and to be able to survey them. But the, my real um, thing is how we're going to address this nutrition knowledge deficit, which is not going to be shoveling information at people. We have to figure out a way to um, encompass it in a set of values that people need to take more highly, and that's my uh, big worry. An interesting study to end off here that has come up, came up recently that my students found interesting this year, where people were looking at Americans and how Americans feel about nudging um, in different ways. So um, lots of people are opposed to nudging of any type. Some people are, um, if they're pretty empathetic with other people, they think nudging is all right. And this is something we need to take into consideration if you're ever going to use nudges that I think has already been said. I thought this was a kind of nice study. With that, I'll be quiet. Thank you. All right, we have uh, time for a few questions. Daniel in the back. Thank you. Uh, Dan Sellen, University of Toronto. Another very beautiful talk. Um, my question is about the nutrition knowledge measure that you found uh, associating in different directions with the choices. Um, my question is about the worry of, of circularity in how people frame their thinking around food. So how do we measure knowledge? Could you tell us a little bit more about those scales? Because so how, how did I measure knowledge? Yeah, in these studies, because there's, in, there's in, content there that, that may push people towards certain views that provide the results that we Yeah, and um, I've al I also do experimental controls in some of these studies where I ask people their nutrition knowledge before they do something like a stated preference experiment and some I do after to see if there's any differences in how you set up the, the structure of the experiment. The nutrition knowledge that, um, that I do is basically about around about specific nutrients. So if the study was about dairy products, I would ask about a number of nutrients like vitamin A content, calcium content, those kind of things. Um, uh, the, the statement could be phrased as, um, consumption of whole fat milk is high in calcium. Um, and they would say they, on a Likert scale maybe, um, is one way I've done it. So they um, strongly disagree to strongly agree with that statement. I also subsequently asked them how confident they are in their answer. And so it's a combination around a particular nutrient and then we aggregate, um, sometimes using factor analysis, sometimes using sums across a set of statements. And of course, there's a couple in there that are not true about a particular dairy product and many that are true and that's randomized and they see it in different orders, that sort of thing. So if I was doing something on eggs, they, the set of nutrients that I might look at are slightly different. So it's a very specific nutritional knowledge um, indicator that's related to the products that they might be making choices about or for which I want to change the choice architecture in some way. So it's not a, I know I'm supposed to eat more fruit and vegetables kind of, new, unless I'm, of course, looking at fruits and vegetables, but uh, it's not a, a broad nutritional knowledge, what are the food groups, 
what are you supposed to eat every day. It's very specific to nutrient content associated with individual foods. So I realize it's a big ask and I, I would hope actually that it wouldn't have been quite so important in the many studies that I did, but it does, does seem to be a big predictor of people's ability to make healthier choices independent of different ways of changing the choice architecture. Is that answer? Hi, I'm Zanet Resla. I'm a media communications dietitian. I have a comment and then a question. So my comment is, um, do you think people need to have high degrees of nutrition knowledge to actually eat better? Because based on what Joanna said, maybe we need to bring back the romance of food and make it more visual versus something like the food guide, which is very prescriptive and relies on people's nutrition knowledge. So that's my comment. Um, and you can probably tell that I'm actually not a nutrient-focused dietitian, more about food and the pleasure of eating. My question goes back to your study on the milk and yogurt study. When you talk about your online survey, I'm wondering how representative that is of the Canadian population. Well, we did, uh, we had 1,700 people in that um, survey, and they were from a market research panel, so there was a slight bias in favor of higher income, higher educated, older people. I think older people who, with high educations, think doing surveys is kind of a good thing to do, actually. Um, so not as representative as I would have liked. And as I said in one of the earlier studies, we try to get different groups in, in different ways, and we've been more or less successful with that. It's interesting that the internet access is no longer a barrier um, to even lower income people. Um, but um, how representative were they? Well, they were regionally representative. Um, you know, the number of people with children in the household was the same as the census. You know, all of the, the indicators that you could get at. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. I, I use multiple market research companies, so I get across different panels. I have also occasionally do different surveys at the same time. Uh, with panelists and I see, I get the market research company to tell me if the same people have flushed out in both of the surveys because it's their choice whether to fill it out and I test to see whether their answers to similar questions are close enough so that they are being consistent. So I try to do as much as I, I can with that kind of approach. And I think we get reasonably representative results. And I, I don't think, that, unfortunately, I know there's these biases um, about education and income in the data, but I don't know what else we do since we no longer can use the phone book to call people up and ask them to do surveys. So it's a limitation of that, of that kind of research. The other um, more interesting question <laughs> is, um, I don't think anybody needs to know exactly how much calcium there is in a glass of milk, regardless of the fat content. The fact that they need calcium in their diet is potentially important. I don't care whether they get it from a pill or they get it from a glass of milk, but if they have actually never thought about calcium as a nutrient they might want to think about, then I worry about that. And of course, uh, food has got so many different characteristics. I could have told you about the ways we measure pleasure with food and we look at naturalness and health interests. Um, so all of those things combine, but the nutrition knowledge one seems to trigger um, behavioral responses in the analysis we do more than some of those other things do, except for the people who hate technology. If they think it's got anything to do with genetics, then I'm not having that. But apart from that, the nutrition knowledge is a bigger... So no, do we, do we have to teach people to memorize multiplication tables about nutrients? Absolutely not. Do they need to have some sense of why people say, have a dairy food group, or you know, why some dairy would be good. I have lots of friends who um, decided fat was bad, and so um, you know, they would have three children in the household and they would buy one liter of milk um, for five people in a week, and I'm thinking, I really wonder if there's enough calcium in the diet in that household, but it, they weren't to have fat, so they didn't want any more dairy products in there. Okay, maybe. Maybe that's not a very balanced view of nutrition, so. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.